Chronicles. Somebody says, oh no, this is going to be a long one. <laughs> Jim. Oh, I, I'm sorry. Second <laughs> <laughs> no, Chronicles, chapter 7. <laughs> Beginning of verse 12. <laughs> then the Lord appeared to Solomon by night and said to him, I have heard your prayer and have chosen this place for myself as a house of sacrifice. When I shut up heaven and there is no rain, or command the locusts to devour the land, or send pestilence among my people, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and heal their land. Now my eyes will be open and my ears attentive to prayer made in this place. I want you to think how you would feel if the Lord appeared to you and said, I have heard your prayer. As we just read, that happened to Solomon. We have the honor of knowing that God hears and answers <coughs> our prayer. Proverbs chapter 15, verse 29, says, God hears the prayer of the righteous. Jeremiah 33, 3, he said, call to me and I will answer you. Matthew 6, 8 says, your father knows what you have need of before you ask. 1 Peter 3.12 says his ears are open to their prayers. So that gives you a rundown, just a, a sampling of scripture that tells us God is listening, God hears, and God answers our prayers. There's many more verses that say pretty much the same thing. And then we can see not only that God hears and God answers, but have you ever been in a situation you just didn't know how to pray. Something comes up and you say, man, I, I just don't know how to pray about that. Anyone? Yeah. I, I saw a few heads about it, so I knew you were getting it, but you just don't know how to pray. So for that situation in Romans chapter 8, verse 26 and 27, it, it says this, likewise the Spirit also helps in our weaknesses, for we do not know what we should pray for, but the Spirit makes intercession for us. In other words, God prays for us. He prays on our behalf. Again, in verse 27, it says, He makes intercession for the saints according to the will of God. In other words, He's praying for us. You don't know how to pray. I have that happen many times. I'm like, God, I just don't know how. And he is interceding on our behalf in those situations. And then one more verse here. I know you see a lot more verses, but one more in this, in this realm here. Isaiah 65, verse 24. Before they call, I will answer. The greatest weapon that we as Christians have is prayer. Prayer. Two of the verses I read said, in, in my words, it says he is praying for us. The words in the scripture say he's, he is making intercession for us. Another way I would put it is God is cheering us on. I like to be encouraged. Anyone here like to be encouraged? Like to be, and, and you like to encourage others also. The creator of the universe is cheering us on. That makes it even more exciting for me. Knowing that my God is cheering us on. And here's one of the reasons he's cheering us on. It is to make a difference in this world that we live in. 
He is cheering us on, encouraging us that you and I can make a difference in this world that we live in. We are his hands and feet. When God wants us to do something, wants something done, he uses people right here to get that job done. He uses you and I to make a difference. Now I want to take a minute and give you a brief background of this scripture that I read in 2 Chronicles chapter 7. Here we find Solomon. He's just finished building the temple of the Lord, also known as the house of the Lord. This was quite an incredible building. One report I read said it took over seven years to build. Another one I read said it took up to 20 years to build. But this one fact agrees no matter what reports you read, that it took upwards of 180,000 people working on the temple. That kind of lets you know how massive of a project this was. Now, when it was complete, there was a big celebration. It lasted more than, more than a week. And after all this was done, done, God appeared and spoke to Solomon. And one of the things God said to Solomon is this. If my people. Now in that day and age, people thought that God was speaking about the nation of Israel. But we need to understand something here. If you have asked Christ to come into your heart, forgive you of your sins, that you too are one of God's people. You are included in those words when it says, if my people, because that's you. Doing just that qualifies you as God's people. So the scripture written during Solomon's time applies to you and I also in this day and age. So right now, I'm ready, and God says, if my people will humble themselves and pray and seek my face, turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sins and heal their lands. Now, when someone is telling me something, and part of that something is a promise. I'm all ears. Somebody's going to promise you something. You're listening. And when it's God speaking, even more so, I don't want to miss a word that he's telling me. I want to know what he is speaking to my heart. And the next word he speaks here can be had to, hard to swallow. And here it is. We are to be humble. He wants us to be humble. If my people will humble themselves. That's why it's so hard to swallow. Because so many of us walk around full of pride. You guessed it. Pride is the opposite of being humble. I want to share a couple of things about that word humble. Forgiveness is perhaps one of the greatest acts of being humble. To forgive is to acknowledge a wrong that has been done and also to release the right of repayment for that wrong. Now, when somebody does us wrong, the first thing we want to do is get even. Or some of us do. <clears throat> right? Yeah. In general, people want to get even. If somebody's done something to them, and that, 
you got to be on my side of the fence. I hear this all the time, where somebody has done something wrong to someone else, and, and the only thing I can hear coming from that individual is what they're going to do to get even with that person. Why well, didn't deserve that? No, you didn't deserve it, but God says to forgive. We're to be humble. Purpose in your heart to support others being recognized rather than yourself. But I'm the one that did it. So, let the other person be recognized even though you feel like you should have been the one to be recognized. Psalm 149 verse 4, For the Lord takes delight in his people. He crowns the humble with righteousness. He crowns the humble with, thank you, salvation. The Lord takes delight in his people and he crowns them with salvation. 1 Peter chapter 5 verse 6 says, Humble yourselves under God mighty, under God's mighty hand, that he may lift you up when you're humbled and you are humble, God will lift you up. We don't need to exalt ourselves. God will take care of that for us in due time. Humble yourselves under God's mighty hand that he may lift you up in due time. So I want to share with you some of the names of God. Because this verse says, who are called by my name. So I want to set the stage for what we can expect from God when we pray. Now, this is not by any means a full list of the names that, of God, but Jehovah Rohi, the Lord is my shepherd. Jehovah Shammah, I will never leave you nor forsake you. Jehovah Rapha, the Lord is my healer. Jehovah Jireh, he's my provider. Jehovah Nisi, the Lord who gives us victory. Shalom, the Lord is peace. Elohim, he's my creator. So as you think of all of those names and the definitions that I gave you as you pray, you can pray with confidence that God is your healer. He's your peace. He will give you victory in your trials. Whatever those situations are that come up and you're going, man, what am I going to do? God is the one that will comfort. He's the one that will never leave you or forsake you. The thing to note here is when you go to prayer, God can meet any need that you have. You don't have to remember all of his names for God. There's just one God. And the thing we need to remember is we need to pray. Take action. If you've got something in your life that you need help with, pray. Ask God. What verse 14 ends with, in reference to prayer, God says he will heal their land. you've been in church for any length of time, you've heard messages preached saying God will heal this land in reference to our nation. And I do believe that. And let me say this, we need a healing in our country. We live in a very divided nation. 50% believe this, and 50% believe this, and 10%, no, that's under 10%, isn't it? I was waiting for you to catch on. Our nation is so divided. And the scripture says, if my people will humble themselves and pray, he will heal the land. And not only our country, but the nations around the world need a healing. On our currency, it says in God we trust. 
in our Pledge of Allegiance, it says, one nation under God. But do we really, in God we trust? Do we really believe one nation under God? But as we have seen the nation of Israel so many times has turned its back on God, so we in the United States has turned our backs on God. The question that has been asked so many times to me, has America gone so far away from God that they've gone too far? <clears throat> Have they passed the point of no return? And if we were to make a list of ungodly things within our country, it would be a mile long or more. So I don't want to dwell on that right now. But what I want us to do is to look at it this way. And if I read this scripture correctly, it says, if my people, that says as Christians, will humble themselves and pray and seek my face, then I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sins and heal their land. My question is this. Has the church, have the Christians let down our role in the country? I don't want that one to sink in. You see, if I read this right, if my people are praying, we must first begin to make time to pray and seek God's face before we will ever see this nation turn back to God. All of us need to take a stand together in prayer before we will see a healing in this nation. We can have a great influence on our country if we pray. A story I've heard in the past goes like this. In 1857, there was a 46-year-old man by the name of Jeremiah lived in New York City. Jeremiah loved the Lord. But he didn't feel that he could do much for God until he began to feel a burden for the lost and accepted an invitation from his church to be an inner city missionary. So in July of 1857, he started walking up and down the streets of New York, passing out tracts, talking to people about God. But he wasn't having any success. And God put it on his heart to try prayer. So he printed up a bunch of tracts and he passed them out to anyone and everyone he met. He invited anyone who wanted to come to the third floor of the old North Dutch Reformed Church on Fulton Street in New York City from 12 to 1 p.m. on Wednesdays to pray. He passed out hundreds and hundreds of flyers and put up posters everywhere he could. Wednesday came, and at noon, nobody showed up. So Jeremiah got on his knees and started praying. For 30 minutes, he prayed by himself, when finally five people walked in the door. The next week, 20 people came. The next week, between 30 and 40 people came. They then decided to meet every day from 12 to 1 to pray for the city. Before long, a few ministers started coming, and they said, we need to start this in our churches. Within six months, there were over 5,000 prayer groups meeting every day in New York. Soon, the word spread all over the country. Prayer meetings were started in Philadelphia, Detroit, Washington, D.C. In fact, President Franklin Pierce started going almost every day to a noon day prayer meeting. By 1859, which is just two years later, some 15,000 cities in America were having downtown prayer meetings every day at noon. And thousands came to know Christ as their Savior. It all started with one person that thought there wasn't anything he could do. God put it on his heart to begin to pray. 
And he listened to the voice of God. And it grew from zero to 15,000 cities. You can have an impact right where you are. Matthew chapter 5, verse 13 and 14 tells us, we are to be the light of the world and the salt of the earth. So one of my questions that I always like to throw out to you is, how's that going? Are you the light of the world? And are you the salt of the earth? It also tells us we're not to hide our lights. Is your light shining? Here's what happens when the church prays. You can read about this in Acts chapter 12. Peter was in prison. It says the church prayed without ceasing. In other words, they prayed continually. They prayed continually. And as the church was praying, Peter's chains fell off and the doors of the prison swung open. And Peter walked out of that jail. Acts chapter 2, verse 42 and verse 49. I'm going to paraphrase that scripture. And they continued steadfastly in prayers. And the Lord added to the church daily. Not every Sunday. He says he added to the church daily. Daily. As they pray. And as I said earlier, we tend to look at 2 Chronicles chapter 7, verse 14, as our nation turning their hearts back to God. That's incredible. That's, that's a great goal. But before a nation can turn their hearts back to God, it must first start in the hearts of individuals. It must first start in our hearts, right here in Garberville. We must first look inside of ourselves and make sure our lights are shining brightly. We must first make sure that our salt is doing its job. Acts chapter 17, verse 6, Paul had been preaching in a place called Thessalonica. Some of the people didn't like it. And here's what they said. These who have turned the world upside down have come here also. I stopped to think about that. These who have turned the world upside down. They were referring to just a couple of the disciples. They weren't talking even about all 12 disciples. They were referring to a couple of the disciples. And they turn the world upside down. They were recognized by the community as being people that have done a work. People that have made a difference. These who have turned the world upside down have came here also. You ever wonder what people are talking about you? You ever wonder what anyone's saying about you? You know people talk. <laughs> you know they talk. But what are they saying? So what are people saying about us? What do you want them to say about you? <laughs> do you want to be a world changer? Let it start in you. If my people will pray, he will heal our land. Where's it going to start? Who's going to take up the banner? Let it be us. Let it be each one of us in this room today. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray, seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven, will forgive their sin, and 
heal your land. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I just want to start off with saying I love you. God, our land is in chaos. Many people's lives around us are in chaos. God uses to make a difference in our land. Whether it be right here in our hometown, because that's where it's got to start. Let it spread, Lord. Let it spread. Let us be your hands and feet to do a work for you. And I thank you for that, Lord. 